It was all good. Yeah, it was a Friday night, and I'm in the Gorbals in the south side of Glasgow. I'm with all my mates, and we're sitting in fat gym south. We're all smoking weed and getting ready to go out. I just beat my stash to pick up here. There was a Bob Marley record playing in the background. <laughs> said he was a buffalo soldier. <laughs> Dreadlock rasta. The room was filled with smoke. That sweet smell of weed was in the air. Kipper was there. Tackleberry was there. In fact, Jim. We used to call my mate Tackleberry. You know after that guy in police academy? <laughs> <laughs> He was a big guy, about six foot three, and built like the side of a house. He was always talking about doing people in, stabbing someone or slashing someone in a big blade. He was the kind of guy who pull an axe out from his jacket and say, Right lads, what'd you think of this one? Aye, Charlie, it's a belter. <laughs> <laughs> We tend to go and call him Tackleberry to his face. <laughs> <laughs> then out of nowhere came a bang, bang, bang. As the front door's been put in. They're shouting coming from the hallway. His bodies are piling into the house. All of a sudden, the room door burst open. And before I know it, I'm on the ground, being handcuffed. I was then searched. A bag of pills were pulled from my pocket. I was then charged with possession, with intent to supply a class A drug. Let me rewind back to the beginning. I was born in the south side of Glasgow. And growing up as a kid, I always knew that I was loved. Although at the same time, there was also a lot of chaos going on in the background. My dad owned scrap yards in east end of Glasgow. He was a bit of a gangster. I remember from an early age, he used to bring guns and knives into the house. He even had a set of knuckle dusters that had been made especially for him. It was these bits of metal that were moulded into the shape of his fists and they had these tiny serrated edges that went along the front. And I remember there was a wee boy, he used to sit and play with him. Not really knowing what they were for. He also liked to drink. He was an alcoholic. My mum, she was the opposite of him. She was a nurse and worked at Victoria Infirmary in Glasgow. She was a gentle, kind and caring woman. And then when I was about five, she divorced my dad. She just couldn't take any more of his behaviour. And being so young, I couldn't understand what was happening. And why my dad was leaving us. This really affects me later in life. Because I then used to think that the people who love me most are going to leave me. I never seemed to do well in school. My report card was always the same. Could do better. Easily distracted. It was never a good report card. I never felt good at anything. I was even told I was a waste of space and I would never amount to anything in life. And I believed that report card for most of my life. Mm. I left school with next to no qualifications. In fact, I'm surprised I could read or write for all the time that I was there. I always seemed to fall in with the wrong crowd and from a young age I was involved in gangs. It's quite football, drinking, fighting, and getting into crime. And then in 1987, the new scene had started, and so now I'm taking ecstasy, speed, acid, coke, also called party drugs. Now I'd found something I was good at. <laughs> <laughs> good at getting out my nut. But then I went on to do things I said I would never do. I started smoking heroin with fat <coughs> Even though I knew people got addicted and died, but I thought, that will not happen to me. I'm not stupid enough to become an addict. <laughs> I'm now doing more crime to feed my habit. I'm constantly out of jail. I then went on to do the things I said I would never, 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 never do. I started injecting heroin. My life was spiralling out of control. I even became homeless. By now my mental health was shot to bits and I'm hearing voices in my head. To be honest, most of the time I just wanted to die and end it all. 
hated myself. I hated the person that I'd become. My family didn't want to know me anymore. I hated enough. I put them through hell. I built a tornado going through their lives, causing destruction wherever I went. I fly to them, steal from them, and cause misery. More than anything, I stole their peace. Mum used to say to me that she'd just wait for a phone call from the police to see if we found dead up her clothes. I remember, she used to say to me, son, I just want to see you happy. I just want to see you happy and settle down. That's all she ever wanted for me, is to be happy. I went scoring one night. I met this guy called Patino Rollerplan. I went up back at his house. We were taking heroin and smoking crack. And one of the first things I noticed when I went to his house was a table sat in the corner of the room beneath the window. And on the top of the table, sitting in the middle, there was a Bible. And at the time, I thought, you must be one of the crack pots. <laughs> <laughs> So the next day, Patino had to go to work. And he said I could hang about and wait for him, but I could just head off. So after he left, I went out and I bought a bag of heroin, and then I'm back at his house. I'm drinking a coffee, I'm reading the paper, and I'm taking this bag. And I look up from the paper, and straight over at this table, and I'm staring at the Bible, and there's like a voice in my head saying, go pick it up. And I'm thinking, I'm not picking up. Hang up. <laughs> <laughs> and I start reading the paper again. And again I look up and I'm drawn to this Bible. And again it was like the voice in my head saying, go and pick it up. Hmm. And I'm thinking, no way, I'm picking up. Hang up. <laughs> and I wrestled with this thought. And eventually I gave in and I went over. Picked up. And I could open it anywhere and opened it in the book of Proverbs. And this is when I had the most profound moment of, moment of my life. It was as though God was speaking directly to me, saying, This is what's happening to you. This is why it's happening to you. And so at this point, I'm freaked out <laughs> <laughs> and I slammed it shut. But then it was like the voice in my head again saying, I can help you. From that moment on, I couldn't stop thinking about God. <laughs> and I began to wonder if there was a God, whether he might just help somebody like me. At the time, I didn't know any Christians. But when I used to think about them, I thought, that's what that happy clapper mob. <laughs> <laughs> What are they all so happy about? And then one day, I see this guy helping somebody, and I thought he might be a Christian who's doing a good deed in helping somebody. <laughs> so I say, excuse me, mate. Are you a Christian? <laughs> he said, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I say, still. Do you know any? <laughs> <laughs> mm. It was a wee bit like trying to score here. <laughs> Except this time I'm trying to find somebody that's got God. <laughs> <laughs> Hear me, name that's got God. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out his next door, his next door neighbour was a born again Christian. I asked if I could beat him. I had so many questions to ask. So I met his neighbour and we invited him to church that Sunday. And I remember going along and feeling so uncomfortable. Everybody looked so happy. We were all singing and clapping. We all had their hands in the air. And they all looked like they had their perfect lives. And then 
Here's me, by the hood, in the church. But then the pastor started to speak about God in a way that I'd never heard before. How he was my father in heaven and he loved me so much that he was desperate to have an intimate relationship with me. That he would never leave me, nor forsake me. That he had a plan for my life. He also said God could heal and restore me. And at the end, the pastor asked if anybody wanted that kind of relationship with God. And my hand shot up. I said, me, I do. I then said a prayer. And I gave my life then and there to God. And I asked him to save me. Jesus, amen. Praise the Lord. A couple of months later, I flushed my heroin, methadone, and valium down the toilet. I'd been praying to God and asked him to prove he was real in my life. And then when I came off all the drugs, I had no withdrawals. I slept every night. Whereas my experience before was, I used to go through severe withdrawal. I remember being in jail. Back in the days, when you didn't get a detox. Don't go down to remember those days. <laughs> it had pains in my legs, cramps in my stomach, hot and cold sweats, not sleeping for weeks at a time, and being so sick. But then this time, nothing. And for the first time in years, I had peace. The voices had disappeared too. It was as though God would say to me, do you believe me now? <laughs> <laughs> I began to volunteer in church. And I went back into education. And I found out I wasn't an idiot. <laughs> yeah. I actually had a brain. I went on to study accounting. And I even gained a professional qualification. Mm -hmm. Today, I work as an accountant in a housing association. Mm -hmm. I've own accountancy business. I'm married to the most amazing, beautiful, and kind women. God gave me his best. Yeah. He gave me the desires of my heart. And over the years have been so good to me, I've had promotions at work. I'm on the management committee of another housing association. I'm a treasurer for a charity that helps people with addictions and homelessness. I'm a trustee of another charity down in Stoke. I volunteer with Prison Fellowship. I used to think that good things will happen to everybody else, mm. but they'll never happen for me. Because of all the bad stuff I've done, which was a lot, and good things always seem to happen. When I gave my life to God, he started the process of rebuilding it. He gave me a new report card. Mm -hmm. He says I'm loved, yeah. I'm accepted, mm -hmm. I'm forgiven, Hallelujah. and I'm prosperous. Hallelujah. He turned my mess into a message. Yeah. Let me take you back to Fat Jim's house. Big Taco Berry, he's just eating a toke of joint. The room's filled with smoke, that sweet smell of weed is in there. We're all laughing just before the door got put in. I made decisions then that led me to a life of crime and addiction. I wanted to fit in and be part of the gang. But then somebody told me I've got a man who could save my life. The Bob Malarek are still playing in the background. I don't know playing a redemption song, because these songs are freedom, it's all I ever have, is redemption songs. My name's Alistair McSee, thanks for listening. <laughs>